Read my lips. The crisis in the Persian Gulf, as grave as it is, also offers a rare opportunity to move toward an historic period of cooperation. Out of these troubled times, our fifth objective, a new world order, can emerge, a new era, freer from the threat of terror, stronger in the pursuit of justice, and more secure in the quest for peace. An era in which the nations of the world, East and West, North and South, can prosper and live in harmony. A hundred generations have searched for this elusive path to peace, while a thousand wars raged across the span of human endeavor. And today that new world is struggling to be born, a world quite different from the one we've known, a world where the rule of law supplants the rule of the jungle, a world in which nations recognize the shared responsibility for freedom and justice, a world where the strong respect the rights of the weak. This is the vision that I shared with President Gorbachev in Helsinki. He and other leaders from Europe, the Gulf, and around the world understand that how we manage this crisis today could shape the future for generations to come. The test we face is great, and so are the stakes. This is the first assault on the new world that we see, the first test of our mettle. Had we not responded to this first provocation with clarity of purpose, if we do not continue to demonstrate our determination, it would be a signal to actual and potential despots around the world. America and the world must defend common vital interest, and we will. This is exciting. This is new world order to me means freedom and democracy. I think we will have a continuing responsibility as the only remaining superpower to stay involved. So the new world order to me means freedom and democracy. Keep engaged. Do not pull back into isolation. And we are the United States and we have a responsibility to lead and to guarantee the security. If it hadn't been for us, Saddam Hussein would be sitting on top of three-fifths of the oil supply of the world and he'd have nuclear weapons. And keep his promise even the dark clouds of political crisis gathered over America. After a deluded gunman assassinated President Kennedy, our nation turned to Gerald Ford and a select handful of others to make sense of that madness. And the conspiracy theorists can say what they will, but the Warren Commission report will always have the final definitive say on this tragic matter. Uh, why? Because Jerry Ford put his name on it. And Jerry Ford's word was always good. Word about the president. For seven and a half years, I've worked alongside him. And I'm proud to have been his partner. And we've had triumphs. We've made some mistakes. We've had some sex setbacks. Sometimes I feel like the... Uh... I've been to parties, but I've never seen anything, so... But I've seen uh, some parties down in Washington. I've seen President Bush there. I'm not sure why they're not talking about him. What, what, when, what year was that? Was he president well, was or vice president? vice president. That's when he was still vice president. And I've never met him as president because he became president in 88, and I never went around him after that. You saw him at how many of these parties? I seen him at about three or four parties. And this at every before. one of the parties, I had to, you had a little ID card that you had to have. And they had a little scanner thing that when you went in, they brought it across this thing to get in there and stuff. They had special, and they had uh, special agents everywhere, secret service men everywhere and stuff. And I fell off the balcony <clears throat> of the place. They had a little window and stuff. I was sitting on there and I fell off. Didn't get hurt. I got up. But I dropped my car and I had Secret Service men, there's about 500 guns pointing, you know, about 20 guns pointing at my head when I tried to go back in. Until Larry King came over and straightened it out and said, he belongs in here. And, you know, and I, 
that was kind of a spooky thing when you have all those guns pointing in your face and you're only about 15, 16 years old. But the reason was because the vice president was there, so they had to have all the secret service. But I also seen that some of them, I seen people like uh, Marine Reagan, which is, I believe, President Reagan's daughter. What, what did Pre Vice President Bush hang around after the party was over, or, or what? He was after the party a couple of times, and we were hiding in the closet, but I didn't. I didn't do nothing with him. He was with a black kid and he was with a white kid. What do you mean with a white kid and a black kid? Well, there was one. Uh, Tell black me about kid the time when you were in the closet. Well, me and this other kid. We were. Who's the other kid? Uh, I can't even remember right now. He was from the Washington, D.C. area. So he wasn't from around here. But uh, we were just sitting in the closet talking, just kind of trying to mind our own business. Cause we were, Staying away from the rest of the party. We were in the back room in the bedroom. Was this after the formal party was over? Well, it was kind of during the formal party, but it was after a lot of people had already started leaving and stuff. And remember that this couple of secret servicemen came in. One went to the window and looked around outside the window and stuff. The other one came in, looked in the closet, and we thought he'd seen us. Was it dark? He had a flashlight. The lights were off. He didn't even bother turning the lights. Coming in with a flashlight, looked in the closet. You know, I guess he didn't really look around it because me and him were sitting on the floor right and blowing. It kind of looked like this. He didn't even look down. It kind of looked like that and stuff. Turn around and walk out of the room and stuff, and then we seen this other guy come in and stuff, and I didn't recognize him at first. Was well, the closet door open or closed? It was partially open. Okay. So we could, you know, we could see out there and stuff. And, uh, it's like the two people I knew as Webb. There's two kids as I knew as Webb and stuff. One of them was from... Uh, Here's a white kid, and the other one was a black kid. I seen it two different times. Two different webs. One was a white, one was a black kid. Yeah. Okay. One was from Omaha or somewhere out there. It was the white kid or the black kid from Omaha? The black kid. Okay. He's the one that was from this area. And uh, I seen at the time Vice President Bush go in and. Lampy, Missouri, was a place where I heard. George Bush and Bill Clinton talking. I, where, from from the point of view I had, they certainly were friends, and they didn't recognize any party lines between them. That's something for the, you know, a smoke and mirrors illusion for the public. It's not something they adhere to because they had exactly the same agenda, and that was for bringing in this new world order. I heard George Bush talking at that time. He was talking to to Bill Clinton, and, and I've since photographically recorded it and, and wrote it verbatim in our book, that when the American people became disillusioned with Republicans leading them into the New World Order, that Bill Clinton as a Democrat was going to be put into the office of president. This was decided in 1984. Actually, I'd heard about it even prior to that. But that, as of 1984, they were already discussing it as an absolute fact. It was also discussed and the groundwork for NAFTA that by the time George Bush went into the office of president that Salinas was going to become president of Mexico and they together would be bringing in the um, NAFTA which was the beginning of, of New World Order controls. I was forced to participate in the criminal groundwork for NAFTA the opening of the Juarez-Mexican border to the free trade free trade of drugs, free trade of our nation's children. It's absolutely appalling, the criminal roots of NAFTA. Again, this is detailed in, in the book. But it's interesting to know that these political moves had already been decided way back when. And as I deprogrammed, and as, as I was Oh, it was really something to me to find out people didn't know about this stuff. I and mean, it was so obvious to me. I, I didn't realize that, that people were unaware and had bought into some kind of smoke and mirrors illusions. That, that people were unaware and had bought into some kind of smoke and mirrors illusions of what was going on and never thought to look behind the scenes to what was really going on. But I understand good people don't think that way. They don't have criminal minds. They don't think to look for that kind of criminal activity. Just like these guys are limited in their thinking by immorality, good people are, are, are kind of blinded from, from that kind of criminal activity. 
until their eyes are open to truth. This criminal activity that was going on at that time, the people that were involved were following directions from George Bush. I don't purport to know it all. I don't purport to know that George Bush is at the very top of all this, but he is as high up as I knew. It was my experience that Ronald Reagan answered to George Bush, not robotically, not under mind control, but willingly because George Bush was respected for what he knew about bringing in the New World Order. Consider his past. George Bush first began with the United Nations. Then he went on to head our CIA. Then he ran our country through three administrations that I'm aware of, the Reagan administration, his administration, and the Clinton administration, because Reagan and Clinton both answered to him. Mexican President de la Madrid answered to him and knew that Salinas was, was to be coming into power, and Salinas had more influence in Mexico at that time than, than de la Madrid, that, as far as my experience was concerned. Also, Saudi Arabian King Fahd followed orders from George Bush, <coughs> as did the Prime Minister of Canada, Brian Mulroney. In 1983, I heard Ronald Reagan and Brian Mulroney discussing the New World Order. A better America, where there's a job for everyone who wants one, where women working outside the home can be confident their children are in safe and loving care and where government works to expand child care alternatives for parents. Where our schools challenge and support our kids and our teachers and where all of them make the grade. Where... Now I have some sources, some confidential sources who furnish me information from time to time. And uh, there's code words for some of these various operations. The code word that I'm going to tell you about right now, and this is in my source's own handwriting. He doesn't read, he doesn't write too well, so I may make some mistakes. Uh, the Black Rose is the code word for this. It's a clandestine group of U.S. government operatives, primarily the CIA, which has for many years run illegal drugs and arms operations in both Southeast Asia via the Golden Triangle and the Middle East via the Golden Crescent funded by the British Socialist-based Russell, Russell Trust Drug Cartel. The Black Rose's current chairman and co-founder is an individual known as the White Rose, or GHWB. For us, the opportunity to forge for ourselves and for future generations a new world order, a world where the rule of law, not the law of the jungle, governs the conduct of nations. When we are successful, and we will be, we have a real chance at this new world order, an order in which a credible United Nations can use its peacekeeping role to fulfill the promise and vision of the UN's founders. 